Welcome to your nonprofit power. Good to see you powerful people. I'm excited you're joining us today for the Your Nonprofit Power podcast episode. We have a special guest, uh, a friend, a colleague, and a member of the Magnify Your Mission Mastermind. Fern Rometty Brown will be here from Sewing Opportunities to talk to us about what it takes to drive a global movement how to run an international nonprofit and navigate the funding stream, which is a little bit more elusive than our domestic causes. So welcome to your nonprofit power where we dig into and get real about everything nonprofit leadership. Uh, we want to help you create more money, more mission, and more peace of mind uh, along your journey to changing the world. I'm Amy Fazio, nonprofit growth strategist and creator of the Magnify Your Mission system, and I help nonprofit pros cut the busy work by focusing on the real needle movers to make your vision, to fast track your big vision without the burnout. That's the critical part. So we cover lots of topics on the show, and I have uh, the unique pleasure uh, and privilege to lead a global community of nonprofit leaders who are looking to build out their strategic plan, who are looking to, to build more momentum in their community, enthusiasm, and to, to raise more money so we can make this stuff happen with less stress and we can make it happen faster. Changing the world is hard, but fundraising doesn't have to be, and community building is at the heart of all of it. So I had to invite my friend Fern onto the show to talk about her mission in rural Guatemala and how she brings skills, agricultural skills and support resources and hope to families that she feels eternally connected to. So let's welcome her to the stage. Hey Fern, good to see you. Welcome to your nonprofit power. Thank you so much for having me, Amy. Always a pleasure to talk with you and learn from you about the important work happening in the corner of the world that you're very focused on in Guatemala, but really how that ends up affecting all of us. We're going to get into so much of the juicy behind the scenes work that you do. Tell us a little bit about yourself, Fern. How'd you get involved in starting sewing opportunities? Tell us about your journey and mission. Well, I didn't start out to uh, create a nonprofit. Um, we adopted a daughter from Guatemala and we didn't know what region she was from, but when she was six, she said, I want to meet my real mom. And because I myself have lost biological family, um, my father was his, the sole survivor of the Holocaust of his family, I felt very deeply that this was the right thing to do, that we needed to find her biological family. Um, that took some time and when we did, um, we, after that, we were able to travel to Guatemala and to meet her biological mom and her aunt. And um, it I would say that it was life-changing. And when we, we, we initially started out helping her biological mom, and then we realized that the entire village was destitute. And later they realized that the entire region is destitute and that this, this is in fact, an area of Guatemala that most Guatemalans don't know about. Um, kind of like Appalachia here in the United States, mm -hmm. except in, in, in Appalachia, they have floors for their homes and they have some source of water that they can get to, but, but um, that's not always the case where we're working. So there are a lot of challenges. Um, and one of them is the language as well. Um, the language and culture that even native Guatemalans are not familiar with the language and culture of many of the indigenous communities. That's, that's really interesting. So it's, it's so remote that even, um, even Guatemalan people from other areas of the country don't always know that these villages are there. And certainly if they were to need help or, or, um, or, or connected through the economy or anything else, they're, they're quite remote. Right, that's correct. Yeah, so um, the the reality is that in many cases they aren't connected to the economy, and the reason for that is because they don't have an economy, because there are no tourists there, because there are no resources there. 
Um, it's it's actually an area that's been forgotten by by the world, um, by by even by their own government. So I feel I feel honored to be able to have. I'm going to say stumbled upon this this area of the world and and to be able to um, to provide resources in, in a way that ha hasn't been done ever in history. Well, what's so interesting, Fern, about your vision and your leadership is that not only are you providing resources, which I, you know we want to talk about because uh, what you're building there for sustainability is really something extraordinary. You're you're providing resources. And you're also providing a spotlight, right? You're shining yes. a light on an area and an issues that most of us really would never have the opportunity to truly understand. Mm -hmm. um, as you know, we, we're, uh, we've got Andrea in the group who's working in China. We've got Jill in the group who's working in Senegal. Um, and international nonprofits reaching these uh, difficult to reach communities has, as you said, some additional challenges, everything from language um, to, to just infrastructure. Like how do you actually get help to these areas? How, how do you get your own self to these areas? Right, exactly. And and then the internet con connection when you're not there. Yeah, so, so there, there, there are a lot, of, a lot of challenges for sure. Well, we like to say in in the mastermind, and, and you know, we've been working together for some time, and I've seen an extraordinary evolution of your messaging and how you approach your stakeholders, your community members, people people who care uh, about helping the world. What we like to say is, it's not just the right thing to do; uh, it's good business right? Um, you really have a compelling case of why people uh, uh, do care for different reasons. Um, it's not just because there are people in need that are safe, uh, that are, um, that are challenged with safety concerns. There's political violence around them. I imagine um, certainly we've talked about the, the fear of starvation or not being able to provide for their families. Um, and also just living a meaningful, good life, right? Um, being able to contribute in positive ways to their immediate families and communities, um, but also to their country and, and, um, and the world as well, right? We all have a calling and a mission. That's right. Talk to us a little bit about this. Um, you, you and I have spent a lot of time saying, how do we find the people who care? Who cares about rural Guatemala? And that's a, that's a tough question when we phrase it like that, right? Right. But the fact is the impact you're having is far greater than even just this one community that you're lifting up and, and, and helping in such powerful ways. Yes. How do you talk about the impact your mission is having? Well, thanks to you that we've learned it. I've learned a new way to, to speak about it. So um, this is in the uh, create, create your create a world statement. And um, so Sewing Opportunities is creating a world in, in which racial and social justice um, is being addressed. And uh, because the area that we're working in um, is working with the indigenous poor who have been relocated to that area due to a 36 year genocide that has been called a civil war. But anyway, 20,000 uh, 20, indigenous, mostly indigenous were were, um, were killed during that time. So, um, oh, wow. yeah, um, and it was 36 years. And, and um, the, the area that they've been relocated to is rocky without, um, and they, it's rocky and, and mountainous and they can't grow things there. Yeah. And they also don't have the historical background of knowing how to grow in that land because they were relocated there. So um, we're creating a climate of world peace by providing resources where they are, helping them to to um, have sustaining a climate of world peace by helping a village in rural western Guatemala it's, have, uh, yeah, have the food and the ability to grow the food they need. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's yes, yeah, the eastern highlands of Guatemala. Eastern yeah. Highlands, thank you. Yes. Yeah. And and uh, so that's one one of the you mentioned three things. The second thing is economic justice as a 
path to address the immigration crisis. So <clears throat> um, one, of, one of the things um, that I can share is that the second village that we're working in, with has mostly women because many of the men have left to try to get to the United States, which we know a very small percentage, even if they sell everything they may possibly own their land or whatever, to try to get to the United States, to try to work and raise money to send back home, um, they might simply be captured and returned. And it's devastating for their entire family. Then they come home with absolutely nothing. Um, and so um, the sustainable solutions, uh, allowing them to, what we're doing is greenhouse farming. So because this area is fraught with hurricanes, and I can say that the people who have, uh, who most suffered from climate change are those who are the poorest, um, I think worldwide, uh, the, it's in a hurricane region. And that means flooding, which could be up to three, four feet of water um, in the worst of it. And so how do you grow? something during in that. So the greenhouses are amazing because they um, are, are structures that are built up and then they have a, a, a plastic roof with, um, I, uh, with steel uh, arches for the, the roof. And they're made solidly with wood that's gathered from the forest. Um, and the seedlings are, um, given brought into them and and the soil and the plastic and all of all of those those things so, so they're really they have, equipped you're 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 getting resources here in the united states you're you're no, bringing no. people together from, to from, equip these communities and it's in more than one it's from guatemala city actually it doesn't come from the united states because we couldn't bring well, that across the border I don't correct think. but the resources to make oh, it yes. happen a yes. lot of your fundraising is happening here in the u.s correct? yes absolutely yeah, yeah. i'm going to say and, and then you're, you're able to to get those resources um through appropriate channels to these communities so that they can start this endeavor um mm -hmm. just to build their own system of food making i mean this is this is systems change this is pretty big stuff. And by spotlighting this in one or two communities in the Eastern Highlands, again, you're you're really bringing the issue and the, the conversation to the public. And I think that is one of the greatest gifts. Um, you're telling the, the story of these communities that, um, as you said, go unseen and unheard, even in their own countries. Mm -hmm. So your mission is about um, really creating that that more just world, and and you mentioned the the social justice helping these communities in need in a dire situations mm -hmm. that have been alienated and isolated. Yes. Um, and then the economic justice of making home a viable option for people, so they don't have to cross the terrain to make it to the southern border of the United States in hopes of. Who knows what anymore? I don't. I don't think any of us know <laughs> what's going on down there. But all of us are invested in it being a more fair, and just, and safe process. I would imagine, or most of us, right? I, I would right. Think. That's right. And then the third thing that you're doing in order to move this justice forward, this this peace, this um, notion of world peace, um, is is connecting people through the adoptive process and adopt families who maybe have a similar story of you, is that right? That that maybe yes. families who've adopted from rural communities in other countries. Yes, yeah, definitely. Actually, some, some of the people who really are, are, are strong supporters have adopted from other countries, from Vietnam, from- um, Is that right? Yeah, from China, uh, um, various places, also other Guatemala, parents of Guatemalan children. Uh, are our supporters and they, they believe in what we do because they understand what this yeah. takes. Um, adopting internationally is, is major. It's, 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 it's huge. It's your, uh, it, it, it changes your entire life. I mean, any child changes your entire life. And as both the parent of a child who I gave birth to and also an adoptive child, I, I see that both of those things take all of 
what we have, but um, it's something special to adopt internationally. Um, and uh, I, I think the parents who, um, who do so, they, they appreciate the fact that when I noticed that something was wrong, that I, um, I, I delved into the situation and, and I think that their donations are um, sending a global message in that regard. That, that we need to to Ooh. care for one another. My God, Fern. I mean, this is, yes, this is absolutely about food and agriculture, but it's so much bigger than that, right? It mm -hmm. It's really helping people feel connected, whether they're literally in, in the Eastern Highlands in, in rural Guatemala, or um, they're an adoptive family that want to connect with other families that have had similar journeys or um, even an adopted child who wants to feel whole in understanding, you know, their their background and their history. That takes an amazing leader and mom um, to uh, take that journey with with your daughter. That's pretty special. That's pretty amazing. And um, uh, I know that journey doesn't end. I imagine that's a lifelong journey. Oh, for sure. It so, is. Yeah. It's certainly the way you set it up, it is. <laughs> so, so. <laughs> I think for every parent, it's... Um, Maybe not every, but most parents, it's a lifelong journey. Remarkable, truly remarkable. So I'm kind of jumping around to, you know, take us where we need to go. But here's something I have found interested in working with, interesting in working with you, Fern, is I, I remember coming to me in February and you have this great project idea and partnership going on. You're, you're great at building partnerships. I know that from working with you. And... However, when you're working in um, uh, a, a community that's far away, that's remote, that has political, social, and economic challenges going on, I imagine you have to be pretty flexible and nimble um, in, in your goals and in your plans. Would you say that's true? Is, is that some of the challenge of running an organization that serves internationally? D definitely, yeah, because sometimes what we understood to be true isn't true anymore. And, um, and we have to pivot. Um, I mean, I think, you know, that's, that's what we all did during the pandemic so we can relate to that. Um, but uh, recognizing that some of what we thought was um, our basis, um, for example, we, we knew that the second village that we're working with was far from the, far further from the water source than the first village that we were working with. And we thought it will be life-changing for every family to have rain barrels. And then we found out that some do already have that. So um, th then we thought, okay, we can provide that for those who don't and we can um, have rain spigot, um, the spigot so that they can have the water go in and take the water out. Um, because water is essential, not only for life, but also if you're watering vegetables, you need to have water available. Um, and the rainwater is cleaner than the water from the polluted river. So um, mm. that's another direction. But every time we learn something new, we have to think about, okay, let's, let's, let's shift things here. Yeah. And, uh, well, that's certainly important to be nimble and, and uh, to be responsive. Um, how do you message that to your community of supporters and your donors? Are you ever... Um, you know, I, I, we, we spent some time thinking about, oh man, this, this sort of change, this project isn't going to happen in the way we thought, but we just talked to our donors about raising money for this. How do you feel about approaching your donors with this reality that things change um, and pivoting is necessary? Have well, you ever I, been challenged by that? Talk to us about that. Almost oh, definitely. Yeah. I, I had thought that, oh no, they're going to not trust me anymore. But in fact, um, when I approached each and every person who gave personal donations um, for a particular purpose and was able to say, oh, we are not going to be able to, for example, purchase the land to work with Habitat yet because we don't have the funds available. They said, that's fine. Use it for whatever you need to use it for because they believe in our mission. So that was a, an incredible vote of confidence. Fern, I, I love that success story because I want all our nonprofit leaders to hear that, that by being honest and if you're grounded in a plan, 
And as a leader, you're asking the hard questions that, as you said, leads to new information. You have to be open to let that affect your strategy. And by simply going back to talk to your donors um, and letting them know, inviting them on the journey of leadership, not just as the ATM machine of it, um, it really does make a big difference for those relationships long term. Um, I, I worked with an organization, um, MSD Foundation, with a, a tremendous leader, um, Amber, and she was on a journey to solve a rare disease that only affected 100 children worldwide. And they happened to get amazingly lucky in the research that they found the the, the gene that would um, cure the disease. And so they were ready to go to market sooner than other diseases that maybe affected a lot more people. But as you, she was going on this journey, and I think this is an important parallel story to yours, as she's going on this journey, that price tag keeps changing. She's learning about what it means to work with pharmaceutical companies. And she's thinking, oh my God, they're never going to trust me. I have to go tell them that we're not as close as I thought. We need another 2 million. And I'm thinking, lady, you are fighting pharmaceutical companies on behalf of the people to make a more fair and just world. You've got an amazing story to tell, and it's okay that you don't have all the answers. And so, Fern, I, I shared that story because I remember us talking about something similar when you were trying to figure out how best to share this change of direction with, with your funders. And because they trust you so much, it just worked out beautifully. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that, that trust continues to skyrocket. So I want to jump in on uh, the challenges with fundraising because running an organization that serves internationally, you know, for, uh, as a fundraising expert, we're both fundraising experts. Um, it is particularly challenging. It is particularly challenging. Um, and it's not to say that people don't care, but you really have to connect the dots of why this matters to them, which means you have to know your donors very intimately and I think that's the work you've done over years, Fern, and that's why you're able to say, gosh, not only is this just the right thing to do for, for social justice and economic justice or, or social justice uh, issues, but it's also good economic policy that can help us at the border. Um, and it's good for American children and children all over the world to feel connected God knows that's what we need in this world right now is people feeling more connected and less isolated, right? Um, you just hit on so many different funding streams, quite frankly. But as an international organization, you hit challenges with fundraising. Are there areas of fundraising that is difficult for you to break into at this stage of your organizational growth? Yeah, definitely. Um, I have never successfully uh, received grant funding. I wish I could, um, or, or corporation. And I'm hoping that those will change. Um, I uh, am trying to understand more about how to craft a good grant presentation and also how to speak to uh, corporations by working with civic groups and uh, working with faith-based organizations. They are more open. And so that might be an avenue to be able to, to do that kind of work. And government as well, the U.S. government. I'd I'd love to be able to figure out how to to make to connect the dots for them to recognize how important it is for them to fund us and to because the a very similar kind of funding is happening eight nine hours west of where we are, and so let let's 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 move it a little bit to the east and help these folks who are. <laughs> Who are more uh, uh, desolate, I would say. They're, they're, they're more isolated. And well, and also investing in an organ a mechanism, an organization that has the track record of, of getting results um, is uh, is needed, right? Because you can really help the government achieve its goals um, by achieving your goals. So that is uh, makes a lot of sense. In the Magnify Your Mission program, we go through two very important first steps. The first is mapping out that messaging, right? Making sure we've got that tiered messaging so we are attracting the various groups of people who care. We need a big tent to solve big problems. 
And the second is mapping out this 12 month fundraising plan. And Fern, we've been moving through this and it takes time, especially when it's your first time planning. And um, we, we do just what you said. We kind of move through these, these pockets of funders and decide based on this unique mission, this unique leadership style, and the particular track record of success we have to sell, um, we start to ruthlessly prioritize where we're going to spend our time. And with international donations, and especially really when you're strengthening your fundraising overall, those individual donors become so important. You know, the people that um, are connected with you as a leader, and, and you really continue to build out that approach. And you have a campaign this September that's going to target your, your second hottest um, area of focus for fundraising. Can you talk to us about your September campaign? Yes. Yeah, so this was really developed with your suggestions and also um, Kelly Burgess Har Harper, who uh, is part of your team, I think I could say. Um, your communications coach, exactly. Yeah. And she, she, she and you helped me think about um, when so when would the the three air three times of the year or four times of the year be most appropriate for a campaign and i i thought for a second time of 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 a campaign i can link two important things one is guatemalan independence day so we can talk about the independence of the people um so they are free from poverty um being able to have self-sustainability. And the other is the Jewish holiday of Rosh Hashanah. So that one of the concepts there is to repair the world, tikkun olam. And by doing so, it means that we are helping people to help themselves instead of doing for them, um, allowing them to have a reason to stay in their area. And I think these two concepts together, freedom and repairing the world, would appeal very much to faith-based organizations. And so I'm making a list of faith-based organizations and putting together a um, an introduction uh, that I'm gonna work flesh out with Kelly Burgess Harper um, at our next meeting next week, and then plan to address them, um, I think in the month of August, prior to, to September, prior to the, the date coming up. I actually am going to be in Guatemala just prior to their Independence Day and prior to Rosh Hashanah. So uh, it, it, I think things will come together and I can probably um, speak to some of that while I'm there. Fern, I think that's an, an amazing focus. I mean, I, I think it's so hard as an executive director, a founding executive director, nonetheless, really building that sustainable infrastructure um, that that you can continue to excel from. What I what I've seen you accomplish in the last few months is really that that disciplined focus, which is the hardest thing to do um, as a leader, in my experience, I'll say. Uh, yet it gives the most peace of mind. It gives the most, it really requires us to lean and trust in both a good plan um, and ourselves. <laughs> yep. Yeah, and faith in God. Yes, yes, yes. It, and trust ourselves that we will figure, we will figure that out, that the, the money is there and that the people who care, our job is to go and find them with the right message. And I have just seen your confidence grow and your strategy grow. And I love this, um, focus um, on, on repairing and connecting us all. So uh, repairing the world and connecting us all. So I think that's fantastic. The temptation is we want grants, we want government money, we want major donors, we want the recurring giving, we want, we want, we want it all right now. But the trick to cutting the busy work is picking one of those at a time, building out the strategy that's repeatable, wash, rinse and repeat, and then from there, grow the next set of, of strategies um, for the next uh, target audience. And while grants, I don't think is your next one, um, I think you're building the story and the experience to, to take it to that level. Government, however, government, I, 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 uh, I love your uh, tenacity there and your focus there because you're right. You're doing the work of the United States government who has 
reason and a mission uh, to help keep people in their home country. So thanks for what you're doing. Thank you so much. How can folks uh, stay involved and, and what else, uh, what else would you like to share with us and how can um, people stay involved and follow along your journey, Fern? Uh, you, we do have a newsletter. Um, we're, we're on social media. Um, we would be grateful for you to follow us on Facebook and Instagram. And um, I don't know if the link can be put there or, I mean, it's just sewing opportunities. Sewing opportunities. I'm going to add the banner here and then we'll add the link in the comments um, um, of the, the show as well. So yeah, we will make sure to uh, include it, but sewing opportunities is the organization and the handle on Facebook and Instagram. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you. And um, so two things, two directions that we're going in, I mentioned uh, speaking. So um, you, if you know of an organization, I would be grateful to be invited as a speaker um, to, so that people can hear about building a movement in areas that are remote, like Guatemala. That would be one. Love it. And, and the second one is um, we are uh, working with an organization called the Thread of Hope Guatemala Fair Trade. And um, if people are interested in seeing the work, um, you could either come to our shows if you're local, or if you are not local, um, A Thread of Hope has agreed to give a percentage to sewing opportunities um, if we direct them to the website and they put the word sewing as a code in the check checkout. Excellent, excellent. So the best way to get that code and information is probably just joining your newsletter, I'm thinking. But these, sure. these, this art, um, these products and art are just beautiful. And I love that you have a social enterprise component of your funding. Um, and we definitely want to make sure to mention this, that by, by purchasing beautiful pieces of uh, jewelry and handcrafted goods, you, um, a portion of that goes to not only supporting the community that created, the artists that created um, the goods, but also Sewing Opportunities Mission, helping Fern get more resources um, directed, not to just to the villages she's helping now, but the plan in the future to That's expand right. even more regionally. That's right, yeah. So to recap the three things, uh, take a look at the fair trade. The best way to do that is to go to sewingopportunities.org website. Is that the right um, website? Yeah, it is. Yeah. And and there's a section on the website that's focused on uh, Guatemala fair trade. Um, and on our events page, it mentions all of the shows that we're doing that are upcoming and also uh, how you can purchase directly from A Thread of Hope. Um, because we have some items here, but she has so many more items at, on her website. Is that right? Um, she's a master. Yeah. 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 And they they are incredibly beautiful. I mean, th this, so I can just tell you for, for instance, um, Please, right. Yes. Uh, what, what her name is Eliza Strodes. What she does is um, supply the artists with, bamboo thread because bamboo does grow in Guatemala, but not, there are no bamboo factories there. And uh, the artists use that to make incredibly beautiful scarves and purses and wallets. And um, so it's both a fi fine bamboo and also a chenille. Uh, another is that she purchases uh, Czechoslovakian glass beads and they make incredibly intricate um, beaded animals and birds, hummingbirds and uh, different jewelry. And we sell a lot of it. It's absolutely breathtaking. It, 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 I, I will vouch for it. It's just beautiful, beautiful items and yeah. art. Thank you. Thank yeah. you so much. And, and Fern, I, I just want to give a shout out to you. Just such remarkable leadership to bring in that revenue stream, not just to um, generate some revenue for the mission, which it certainly does, so you're, you're uh, purchasing, um, your, your gift to buying uh, power uh, really helps the mission. Um, uh, but also then just sharing, you know, beauty from the area and of the people and sharing that with the rest of the world, being that vehicle to do that. 
Yeah. Um, Fern, you were one of the most genuine and authentic leaders I've ever had the honor to work with. And I wow. uh, love cheering you on. Um, and I appreciate uh, the work that you're doing for all of us. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Amy. Thank you so much for this opportunity to speak. Yes. And please follow sewingopportunities.org. You can find them on uh, social media, um, but you can go to the website, get in on the newsletter and check out the fair trade goods. Um, help this amazing community and yourself at the same time. Why the heck not? Um, <laughs> right. That's all right. No, no, no harm in that. Um, Fern, thank you so much. Thank I appreciate you, you being here. Um, we're going to have you uh, step away as we close out the show. Thank you. So good to have Fern and others on the podcast talking about their journey and what it takes to grow their organization because it takes more than big hearts. It takes lots of money and we have got to protect our nonprofit leaders out there on the front lines, doing the important work on behalf of all of us. The burnout, the threat of burnout is real. The stress, a lot is riding on your shoulders. Um, sometimes it feels like the weight of the world. So we want to give you the easy steps to follow to do that. Um, and one of the main reasons I started even this podcast was to have leaders like Fern come on and, and share what their steps have been and where they see themselves going next. None of it's perfect. Nonprofits are messy. Changing the world is hard, but fundraising doesn't have to be. We can help you crack the code on that. So thanks for joining us today. And if you're interested in working together in the Magnify Your Mission program, please check out my website at amyfazio.com. Take the quiz. What type of fundraiser are you? We're going to help you zero in on what your next power, next steps are um, to declutter your fundraising and focus on those power moves because uh, the world is counting on us. So we'll see you next time at the next episode of Your Nonprofit Power. And in the meantime, stay in your nonprofit power. And remember, you've got everything you need in your universe. We can help you fast track that mission. Uh, you're doing fantastic work out there. Thanks so much. Have a great day.